On the second page of my copy of Dreams of Trespass, in het Nederlands was het het verboden dakterras. I have written, I have written World Shake 2000. I'm not sure if anyone remembers this event. It was a, a big thing. It was a mass event in Mechelen that gathered tens of thousands of young people who were all connected with um, the youth movement and with the World, World Organization and so on. And honestly, I vaguely remember anything of it myself, but apparently I have bought my first Mernissi book on that event. And what I had read in that book had stayed longer with me than, um, than memories of this event. It's the book that we just heard about um, uh, in, the, in the interview. Um, the stories in that book, and especially the created atmosphere and a created universe in it, they, um, this is what is memorable about it. I was then 18, and I had already decided that I wanted to study Middle Eastern studies and Arabic in Leuven. And I was probably drawn to the book for its feminist appeal and for wishing to understand some of the obscurities and stereotypes that uh, surround the topic of women in the Middle East. As the subtitle was also saying, it's a, um, it's a book with stories of Fatima Mernissi's youth in a harem in Fez. And indeed, many stories were told in it, and I remember, I still remember very well getting immersed in that, in reading her narrations of women-only rooms of what it meant to be living in gender-segregated houses, of the open, honest talks and interactions between women, and a created intimacy and playfulness among them. It did not conform to any of these Western stereotypes of Arab women um, or of stereotypes of harems, portraying women as passive sexual objects or suffering victims of men's restrictive commands. On the contrary, the book actually, for me, showed women as amazing, wise women who have actual thoughts. And their thoughts are not on men, but they ponder on such great topics as the meanings of freedom, on how one can feel free and be free even when being constricted to certain rules and boundaries. And above all, I find that the book was a great celebration of imagination. Imagination as a political tool, as a survival mechanism, a psychological survival mechanism. Imagination as producing creativity and joy. So as a reader, feeling sorry for the women is no longer uh, a dominant feeling. Um, because you have become overwhelmed by many other realities and complexities in the stories. Then a few years later, I read Orientalism by Edward Said. Um, so I read about Westerners writing about the Middle East, studying those places with or without ever visiting them, trying to capture its people and its history, most often guided or rather misguided by simplistic underlying questions and deficient theoretical constructs. So by that time I was already in Leuven studying Middle Eastern studies. And it's a bit similar to Sarah's story. Of course, I didn't read, I wasn't handed the book within the frame of my education <laughs> in the entire time. It was handed to me by an outsider friend. And it was a wonderful gift because it allowed me to understand some of what was going on, in fact, in our department. <laughs> so as I was reading, I had the luck, or maybe it's better to say the misfortune, of actually witnessing what I was reading about in practice, like fully embodied in real life. <laughs> and that was, um, of course, I, I don't think this is any surprise for, for us when we know about how education has been um, in the last time. And I, I really think that it also has changed a bit. But in that time, it was special and confusing and frustrating because back then I felt uh, powerless against it. But now let's go back to um, Mernissi, because I also started to wonder whether she hadn't been reinforcing some of that Orientalist thought as well in, in her writing. That focus on a harem as a topic, it's not really representative of young Moroccan women's lives. And also the book tends to play out the typical theme of modernity versus blind tradition. And the overall message is sort of that the time of the harem and its patriarchal mindset is over and needs to give way to modernized, westernized life. But then, isn't Orientalism something white people do 
to brown people, to say it quite simply. Can a Moroccan author be Orientalist too in her affirmation and reproduction of Orientalist themes and prejudices? And I didn't really want to become uh, too academic and boring, but still I want to <laughs> say a quote, uh, because this problem is expressed very well by Lila Abulohot. Uh, speaking about feminists' work in the Middle East, she says that um, to launch feminist critique in a context of continuing Western hegemony is to risk playing in the hands of Orientalist discourse. It is, it is really that simple. Expressing yourself within a certain frame and environment risks being um, ended up uh, being abused. So she does that, Manisi risks that, and it seems that she knew very well about it and she decided to continue in full force ahead. Um, and that becomes, I think, most obvious in her books, The Veal and the Mil Elite, and in Islam and Democracy. Um, I want to check um, my copy of Islam and Democracy, but um, I have been, uh, it's missing and I, I, I remembered a long time ago that, I, that a friend has borrowed it, so, but I have totally lost track, so in any case that it's one of you, can you please like, you know, <laughs> bring it back to me? So. Um, so these two works, Islam and Democracy and The Veil the veil and the Male Elite, they are part of a double effort for her, for Manisi, showing Islam's compatibility with human rights and women's rights and with democracy. These two features of modern society are identified by Manisi as crucial achievements of, hu of human civilization. And she really wants to prove that Islam fits within that frame. That is her passion, that is what her drive, what, what made her do this um, very uh, investigative historical work. So I still remember that I was fascinated by her methodology in Islam and democracy because she revisits the typical Orientalist themes in her own original manner. Um, in these books, it's the, it's the method of going back to founding Islamic texts. So Orientalist scholarship also returns to founding Islamic texts and periods to find answers for current situations. Mernissi, she does roughly the same, but she blows up traditional Islamic scholarship in the meanwhile by laying out her own radical and revolutionary methodology and hermeneutics. So I really uh, want <coughs> to show my appreciation for her. I, I hope that that outbalances my, my critique. Um, and I wanted to end with telling about um, this picture that was taken a few weeks ago at a MESA conference in Boston because it was an entire panel <laughs> dedicated to Manissi's work and there were really great uh, contributions there as well discussing, um, discussing her work, the radicality, the boldness of her personality and there were also many people in the audience who had been attending previous events and who were still about to attend uh, other events so it was really also a bit of uh, so community gathering. Um, and one, one of the uh, persons in the audience said that, uh, that she had uh, attended a conference in Ujda that was um, organized just a few days before and that she was happy because there the contributors had been expressing also their praise and celebration but at the same time um, being critical of some of her work. Um, so I think what, what's really interesting about her is that Yes, she can easily be blamed to be playing into the hands of Orientalist discourse, but there is also something really greatly defiant in her attitudes and in her resolve not to let herself be restricted by that super frame. Thank you.